I started working with black bears about 25 years ago, and I came at it from rather an unusual angle. I graduated from the University of New Hampshire in 1974 with a bachelor's degree in wildlife, and had hoped to go on to graduate school to do the kind of work I'm doing today. But unfortunately, I'm dyslexic, and my grade scores and test scores were below par, and I failed to get into graduate school. As a result, I went west to a trade school and learned the art of gunsmithing, and have employed myself as a custom gunsmith and gun designer over the last 30 years. I met my wife, Debbie, who was sitting over by our table at Colt Firearms, and uh, in, in uh, 1982, we returned to New Hampshire, and I still had it in my mind that I wanted to do the kind of work that I wanted to do. I had a leg up on this because my father, Lawrence Killam, who was a virologist at the Dartmouth Medical School, studied birds as an avocation. Uh, when I was two, my dad went on sabbatical to Africa and brought a half-grown leopard into the house, <laughs> much to my mother's chagrin. My younger sister, Phoebe, who helps me with the bears today, was one at the time, and my next oldest brother, Josh, was four. He woke up one evening with a leopard at the end of his bed screaming, but needless to say, we all survived and returned from Africa with two African hornbills and a Nile crocodile that my dad raised in a basement shower until it was six feet long and the National Zoo had to come take it away. In 1961, uh, we moved uh, back to New Hampshire. Uh, I was nine years old, old at the time, and my dad continued his interest in, in birds and wildlife. Uh, he had licenses to keep uh, both wild birds and native wildlife. Uh, we had uh, woodpeckers and aviaries and crows and ravens and hawks and owls. We had a beaver in the kitchen that leveled the floors and dammed up the toilet. <laughs> we had a porcupine in the greenhouse beside the house. So I had a lot of exposure to, to wild animals. Uh, when my time came along, I was interested in studying carnivores. Uh, I, I wasn't thinking about black bears uh, because there was no formal rehabilitation of black bears. I was thinking more along the lines of a bobcat or a coyote or perhaps a fisher, the large woodland weasel we have. But I had to come up with a different plan. Uh, my dad, uh, in, his, in his bird study, used simple apparatus. He had a pair of binoculars and a small folding chair. And he and my mother would sit in front of woodpecker nests and document courtship and behavior. But again, carnivores presented a problem. Any of you who have been in the woods know that if you get a glimpse of them, they disappear rapidly into the brush and you don't get much chance to study their behavior. But based on my childhood experience, I realized I could raise an orphan animal loose in the forest and document its juvenile behavior and use that to understand its adult behavior. Um, uh, my sister Phoebe and I became licensed wildlife rehabilitators in hopes of getting one of the animals I was interested in. Phoebe was interested in husbandry and I was interested in behavior. But after two years, none of those animals came our way. <clears throat> then one day, a conservation officer broke departmental policy and brought us an 11-month-old black bear cub that he thought had been hit by an automobile. It turned out it had not been hit by an automobile, it had no infectious disease, yet it still had the shakes and couldn't climb or stay on a branch. Uh, I was interested in finding out what the cause of the illness was because wild animals uh, often get sick but they disappear. We never know what, uh, what the causes are. Uh, but the, the animal was quickly confiscated from me for a lack of a permit. But later that spring I got a call from the director of uh, fish and game in New Hampshire, and he asked me if I'd take the bear back. And uh, I assured him what I was planning to do. I was going to observe it until it could no longer fend for itself, and then I expected we'd have to euthanize it, which sadly happened. But we sent his brain out to the Wildlife Disease Lab in Wyoming and got a diagnosis of lysosomal storage disease. The human equivalent of that is Tay-Sachs, and it's caused by inbreeding in populations. This was the first documented case of lysosomal storage disease in black bears. It's very rare in wild animal populations, relatively common in domestic animals, uh, because that's how we get our domestic animals. And uh, since that time, there have been two more cases in New Hampshire, two in Massachusetts, one in Maine, and more recently, one out in Wyoming. 
The likely reason that this uh, became prevalent in the population was the fact in the 1850s, most of New England, 85%, uh, was open agricultural land. The forest habitat of the black bear was greatly fragmented and, and reduced to small areas. And on top of that, there was 125 years of bounties on black bears. So their populations would have been reduced to small island populations where this type of inbreeding might have occurred. For every cub that's born uh, with it, there's a cub born without it and two cubs uh, that are carriers. So it persists in populations. Later that spring, I got a call from Forrest Hammond from Vermont Fish and Wildlife, and he'd heard about what I was interested in doing. And he had two orphan black bear cubs uh, from the Stratton Mountain Bear Study in Stratton, Vermont. He interviewed me, and he asked me if I'd take the two cubs. And I said, well, you know, there's a little issue of a permit. And I said, if you'll call New Hampshire Fish and Game and they're willing to give me a permit, I'll be happy to take the cubs. And the next morning, I had a permit in hand and since that time, we've raised, rehabilitated, and returned to the wild over 130 black bear cubs. Uh, about four years ago, we had an extraordinary number of cubs. <laughs> we ended up with 30 of them. And uh, this was due to a very good food year, a beech nut year, uh, uh, followed by uh, an early spring with 70 and 80 degree temperatures in March, uh, was, which disrupted the apple and berry crops and left a lot of hungry female bears. Uh, over uh, half of these cubs came to us because their mothers were shot at unprotected uh, chicken coops. And by unprotected, all you need to do to keep bears out of anything is have a good electric fence with bait on it. Bears, by bait, I mean wipe the wires with peanut butter and keep smell on the wire. Bears check out all new smells with their tongue. And once they've been zapped on the tongue, they have very little interest in what's behind the fence. Uh, the following year, we had uh, just one cub. And the year after that, we had 25. And it followed uh, this past year. Uh, we didn't have any until October when, when four cubs came in. But in the year we had 25, they came to us uh, at the earliest time ever. Uh, the first cubs arrived on February 7th. Uh, two of these cubs were the result of a winter logging operation, which is pretty hard to avoid. Uh, but the other two cubs, a rabbit hunter chose to shoot the mother bear in the den and then let his dog get after the cubs. One of them had visible wounds and we were able to, to uh, uh, get it to survive. The other one died after a week. Uh, we suspected that it got crunched by the dog and had internal injuries. This was in Maine? This was in Vermont. Uh, that took place. And the, uh, the logging cups came from New Hampshire. We followed, uh, we put tracking collars on three of the, uh, of the cubs that uh, came in, in in the year of 30, the three uh, that we felt were most at risk. Uh, they were the bottle feeders. Uh, they were cubs that came to us uh, when they were very young uh, and dependent on us. And uh, when we checked their winter dens uh, three years later, uh, we found that two of them uh, had cubs of their own, and the third uh, didn't have any cubs, uh, but she had moved from an area that was near our place. She got driven out by the resident female. Uh, she traveled 45 miles north and fed in a, a, a berry patch, a logged area, until the berries ran out in September, and then she moved back southeast uh, to an oak stand and stayed uh, in the area where the, where the oaks were uh, since that time. My interest has been in the uh, social behavior of bears. Uh, this chart uh, isn't, you won't be able to read it, but you'll see that it's rather complex. Uh, when I started doing this work, bears were thought to be solitary animals. That is, the only interactions they had with their own kind was with their cubs, their mates during the mating season, and they knew they congregated at concentrated food sources. But beyond that, they knew very little about them. And what I found is that they're actually highly social animals, but they're not social in the way we think of a social animal, like a family group of chimpanzees, uh, or a pack of wolves that have territories and family units living within the territories, alpha animals that allocate resources down through the family groups. 
Bears would like to have territories, uh, but the closest thing that they have to a territory is the female home range. And these female home ranges are evenly spaced on the landscape in a cookie cutter pattern. The foods the bears eat are the highest quality foods in the forest, the nuts, berries, and ants, bees, and grubs. And these foods are generally available in patches, and these patches are unevenly distributed on the landscape. And they're, uh, they're affected by uh, annual and seasonal changes uh, and, and uh, uh, droughts and, and uh, frosts and so forth. So at any given time, one female bear may have a huge surplus of food in her home range and her immediate neighbor could have nothing. And this leads to a system of, has led to a system of sharing that I believe parallels our own uh, social behavior, that these female bears are reciprocal altruists. So if, if one female bear uh, controls an oak ridge and her neighbor controls a beach stand, in the year there's a good oak crop and no beach, uh, the bears from the, from the beach stand come over and feed on uh, that bear's acorns. And in years when there are no acorns and only beach, uh, the bears that own the acorns go over and feed uh, in the beach stand. And that's what I'll be talking about tonight. The, the cubs that I used in this study were the very young cubs that came to me before they had experience with their natural mothers outside the den. Uh, these were bottle feeders. They were dependent on me. And I decided uh, that they needed an education and I needed one myself. So I took them on long walks in the forest, acting like a surrogate mother, up to nine hours at a time and returning them safely to remote enclosures. I was able to observe their very first reaction to their natural environment. I saw their tongues coming out in an exaggerated fashion and sticking to scent on an object and bringing it back to a small bump behind their front, front teeth. This bump is called the papilla of the vomeronasal organ. Uh, bears, like your cats and dogs at home, have two olfactory systems, the vomeronasal system and the nasal epithelium. Uh, the vomeronasal system identifies new scent. The nasal epithelium uh, is able to locate scent and it learns from the vomeronasal system and is labor, uh, later able to identify it as well. This same behavior in adult bears is very subtle, very hard to observe. So I was able to see at very close distances uh, the behavior associated with smell, something that other scientists uh, didn't think was possible because after all, smell is invisible. <clears throat> I followed several of these bears into adulthood. One of them was a bear named Yoda. She lived until she was five and a half years old and raised one set of cubs. But the main bear that I work with is this bear, a bear named Squirty. Uh, Squirty came to me when she was three pounds and seven weeks old. Uh, I, I raised her loose in the forest, took her on walks, and when she became of age, I put a, a radio collar on her and followed her uh, into the forest to see what she was up to. Uh, Squirty uh, is now 20 years old and gave birth to her 10th litter of cubs this winter. Squirty not only established her own home range, but she expanded it. And as she expanded it, she dropped a daughter into the expanded area to control the expansion. And her daughters and granddaughters have done the same thing over the past 20 years. So Squirty now controls uh, a, a greater home range and she controls it uh, with what I call a matrilinear hierarchy. And this is Squirty and her oldest daughter SQ2, another adult daughter SNLO, a younger daughter Brooke, another adult granddaughter S2, uh, and a subadult SQ2LO, who's the daughter of SQ2, Squirty on sight will chase all the members of her family uh, below her. And uh, it's linear because SQ2 will chase everybody below her, <laughs> SNLO will chase everybody below her, and everybody chases SQ2LO. <laughs> the result of this hierarchy is that in a marginal food year, uh, it ensures that at least one of these females will have access to enough food to reproduce. 
Uh, in a good food year, all the females that are ready to reproduce will be able to reproduce. But the second thing it does is it, it gives a place for these young sub-adult females to, to live until an open home range uh, comes up for them. Uh, but there's a price. Uh, if, if they had an open home range, they'd give birth to the first time at age three. Uh, these females that stay in these greater home ranges may not give birth because of being pushed all the time until they're four, five, six, or even seven years old. So the bears have a means of managing their own populations based on a natural food supply. Now, unfortunately, there's nothing natural about the bear's food supply. Bears benefit from logging. Uh, logging will increase the number of female home ranches that the land can support. Uh, uh, they benefit from our agricultural crops. They benefit from our bird feeders. They benefit from the uh, uh, gar food uh, uh, garbage that's left in our, our food bins near the road or in, in dumpsters. So there's a lot of extra human foods that enter the food chain uh, that increase uh, the bear's breeding potential. The young males that came into these female home ranges were quickly chased out. In this series of slides, Squirty is going after her grandson. I watched this guy get chased more than 30 times, uh, not only by Squirty, but by his mother, by his aunts, and any other bear that could get a target on him. And finally, by September of his second year, he left the greater home range and joined the population of bears, male bears in the upper valley. Uh, here's SQ2 as an adult chasing a male bear out of a female home range. The large males that came into my study area came in during the breeding season. And I'll take a moment to explain my study area. It's on a piece of property, a 400 acre piece of property that Debbie, Debbie and I own. It's surrounded by 65,000 contiguous acres. It's a mile off the nearest uh, dirt road in town. I drive up there every evening uh, from early spring until the snow comes in the fall, uh, uh, unless I'm giving a talk like this and then my sister Phoebe covers. I provide a small food reward uh, to any bear that shows up. Uh, some nights no bears show up and some nights quite a few bears show up. But I've been interested in social interactions and in order to write papers today, you've got to have quantitative data. I've recorded, documented over 1,500 uh, social interactions over the past eight years, which I've used as the basis of my thesis. Uh, I got my PhD last December, uh, a little slow in life at age 63. Uh, uh, so this, this uh, study site has been instrumental in being able to bring bears close enough together where they would interact with each other. Uh, and what I found was that they fed first and then they chased each other afterward. Uh, so the large males would come in and, be, uh, and then linger after the breeding season and because of their size, they could take food from whoever they liked. But the females didn't tolerate this behavior very long. And in this series of photos, Squirty weighing about 185 pounds is going after a 350 pound male and asking him to leave. I watched her daughter, uh, SQ2, and she weighed only 135 pounds to a very stiff-legged walk slowly zigzagging in front of a large male. <clears throat> he backed off into the bushes, acted like it was no big deal, but in the morning he was gone and he never returned. And this suggests that there's a degree of female choice in mating because if there wasn't a repercussion, these large males would stay and compete with the females and their cubs in these female home ranges. The big surprise in my study was that there was a number of unrelated females uh, and I, I know they were unrelated initially because I put Squirty out there and uh, I knew who her relatives were, but later on we uh, collected uh, hair samples from all the bears in my study area. Uh, we had their DNA pedigrees done at the UNH Genome Lab and uh, we found out uh, that these females were all relatives of this bear, a bear we called Moose, 
uh, and Moose was 13 years Squirty's senior. But when I put Squirty uh, out there, she was 14 months old. And Moose, uh, I put a radio collar on her brother, and I caught, uh, the first day I, 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 I caught them, uh, they ran on me, which indicated they were with a wild bear. And the second day I snuck in on them, and they, they were in a beach stand. I broke a large stick in the cub's tree, and they started moaning, a, very, a nervous moan. And this bear, Moose, showed up. She false charged me in defense of my cubs. And uh, since that time, uh, Squirty has been friends with Moose and allowed all of her female offspring uh, into the clearing. Uh, Squirty controls an oak ridge, and Moose controls uh, 20, 26,000 acres of beach uh, to the east of Squirty's home range. So in years when there's no beach and only oak, Moose and her clan uh, come onto Squirty's ground, and in years when there's uh, uh, no oak and only beach, Squirties allowed onto Moose's grounds. But the significant thing is that Squirty allows these unrelated females access to her surplus, and Squirty controls all the bears that come into the clearing, and she shows little or no aggression towards them at all. And here I realized was a big parallel to human behavior, because if you think about it, we're much harsher on our relatives than we are on strangers. And we're harsh on our relatives because uh, they're our closest cooperators, and it's terribly important that we communicate with them. Unfortunately, how we communicate is not always pretty, but we can get away with it because we can always reconcile with a family member. But you'd never go out to a stranger and accost them the way you might a family member because a stranger is also a cooperator, and, uh, and you might not be able to reconcile with a stranger. At some time in the future, that stranger might be important in your survival. Male bears were much harder to study than female bears. Uh, the annual home range of a male bear can be as much as 200 square miles. Uh, they usually have smaller breeding home ranges, but they don't stay there for many years. Uh, so early on in my study, I had a radio collar on a male bear. I spent most of the summer uh, in an automobile or an airplane trying to locate him. Uh, I got very little data out of a lot of effort, and I abandoned that prospect. Uh, but later on, as uh, trail cameras became uh, available and affordable, I started documenting the extra bears in my female home ranges. I had observed in, in uh, clear cuts, uh, after a logging, there was a surplus of bears, an awful lot of bear sign. And I put out uh, monitoring cameras with a gallon bag of corn in front of them. I replaced the corn as it was eaten. And it wasn't unusual to, to photograph uh, eight or 10 different males in a two week period. Now, I took an awful lot of pictures. I got to admit, I'm a little slow sometimes. I took 75,000 to 100,000 pictures before I could make any sense out of what was going on. But finally, in 2008, I happened on the best, a perfect situation. The clear cut was 16 years old, right at the end of its productivity. I set out my cameras. I got the eight or 10 different males. Uh, and in 2009, when I put my cameras out, the only bear there was the resident female. But the big surprise was in 2008, I had an awful lot of pictures of two male bears sharing that small amount of corn. Now, I know these bears weren't related because I did the DNA. Uh, these, uh, and I realized that the male bear strategy was to form a loose group of friends and move in and overpower the female to access surplus foods in the female home ranges. I already knew that if they came in by themselves, the, the females quickly uh, chased them away, escorted them out of the home range. So this, this wasn't reciprocal altruism, this is mutualism because these bears are mutually benefiting uh, from the re reward they get by cooperating. But they're still cooperating with strangers. All of this is about the access to food. Uh, these cubs are climbing a red oak tree uh, in the early spring, feeding on the oak leaf starts as the buds first break into leaves. In the spring of the year, uh, the bears eat what I call emerging growth. Uh, there's a wide variety of food available for this time of year. 
uh, none of it's going to make them fat, but it is going to sustain them. Uh, the most important food in the early spring is leftover mast, uh, but in a year like this, there was very little of that. And by mast, I mean nuts from the previous year. Uh, in, in this year in the spring, there's only been green vegetation. They eat nodding sedge in the woodland trails. Uh, they, when they emerge from their dens, they'll eat the swollen buds of beech. By mid-May, they're eating the beech, beech leaf starts, starts, and they'll eat beech leaves, leaves as late as the middle of June. Uh, they, they'll climb uh, white ash and red maple and feed on the flowers. Uh, so there's an abundance of food this time of year, uh, but, but again, the important thing about it is that it's evenly distributed across the landscape and there's very little social interaction uh, about the access to food. Because of this, the bears pick the spring of the year for their mating season. Uh, the female bears come into estrus <coughs> from the last week of May and continue until the first week of July, which coincides with the berry season. The male and female bear spend three to seven days together. The result of that union is a two-celled organism called a blastocyst. They're delayed implanters, so that blastocyst doesn't implant into the uterus until late November, early December. Then there's a short gestation period of 50 to 55 days. The cubs are born in the dead of winter, mid-January, weighing less than a pound. Their eyes are shut, their little ear flaps are down. <clears throat> they continue to develop outside the womb <clears throat> and are unable to, to walk or climb until they emerge from the den in early to mid-April. The first thing the mother bear will do is to build a nest at the bottom of a good climbing tree. She'll coach her cubs the very first time they attempt to climb. The cubs can instinctively climb, but they have to learn about rough bark, smooth bark, and the skinny end of a limb. She'll spend three to four weeks at that site while the cubs are continuing, continuing to develop and are able to follow and climb behind her uh, before, before she moves on to better feeding grounds. And when she does, she'll go to a large uh, pine or hemlock that's near water, trees that I call babysitting trees. Uh, at this time, the cubs will be up still practicing climbing. The mother will radiate out of the bottom of the tree to forage and feed. Uh, the cubs' toenails are audible on the bark, so if anything scares the cubs, they can return in a hurry to see what's going She can turn in a hurry to see what's going on. They'll continue to forage and feed in this fashion throughout the summer and fall. Uh, as yearlings, they'll den with her, and then the family unit will break up the following spring uh, when the male bear shows up. The, the, Family breakup can be rather abrupt. It can go from a tender scene like this one week where the mother bear is uh, grooming her cub for ticks. Um, you can see he's eating it up. You can always tell if a cub has uh, left its mother because it'll have ticks that are visible. Uh, and Before that, she'll have groomed them all off. And the following week, she becomes Attila the Hun. <laughs> this mother bear uh, chased her cub up this tree. And every time the cub thought about coming down, she'd go all the way to the bottom of the tree and the cub would attempt to come down. She'd run back up the tree. I watched her run up that tree nine times in 10 minutes. So if you ever wonder how powerful a bear is, just think about running up a tree vertically nine times in 10 minutes. And then finally, the male bear shows up. Uh, this is Squirty's daughter, SQ2, and her mate for the first meeting for the first time. Uh, you'll see that she's rather aggressive with him. She's been busy with her cubs for the last 18 months. She doesn't know this big lug very well. Uh, and you see that he's calm and collected. He's been out Don wanting around. He's quite comfortable with what's going on. You also can see the size difference between them. It's called sexual dimorph dimorphism. It, it's an indication that the males compete to mate and only the largest uh, 10 to 15% of the males do all the mating. He's opening and closing his mouth, expelling uh, moist air from his lungs and picking up her condition of estrus on the airwaves. <laughs> the 
Finally, he catches up with her and grabs her with his four paws and bites her behind the neck. All of this aggression and the bite behind the neck helps stimulate the female to ovulate precisely at the time of mating, which ensures that conception will take place. Uh, this first coupling only lasted a few minutes before they broke up. There was another 20 minutes of pre-courtship behavior uh, that I was able to observe at close range. They had open mouth wrestling and standing up facing each other. There's some pictures in my latest book, uh, Out on a Limb, which is also in the company of bears. The, the publisher decided to change the title for the paperback, but, uh, but there's a nice uh, picture section in there showing this type of behavior. And finally, he got a hold of her a second time, and, and this time uh, they literally hooked up. The male bear has a baculum or penis bone that's, that's hooked like a dog's. It locks over the female pelvis. They were locked together for about 45 minutes, and during this time there was another female bear in the clearing who walked by him 10 feet away, rubbernecking as to what was going on. <laughs> and finally they broke up and disappeared into the forest. 85% of the black bear's diet is vegetative matter. Uh, the remaining 10 to 15% is animal protein. And of that animal protein, 90 to 95% is ants, bees, and grubs. Now having said that, uh, bears are opportunistic predators. They don't respond to movement or sound in the woods like a coyote or a bobcat might. Uh, but they will uh, take advantage of anything they come across. Uh, they can catch deer fawns in the first week of life or moose calves in the first week of life. Uh, they'll take a bird's nest if they come across it or a fledgling bird off a branch. Uh, they'll also go after uh, domestic chickens that I mentioned before uh, and sometimes livestock. But these bears are usually uh, removed from the population. I used to tell audiences that bears ate ants 10 or 15 times a day. I was out with Squirty one afternoon and she'd run her nose along a log and bite into the log and uh, expose a colony of ants. She'd lick up whatever larvae and ants got in the way. She'd move on to the next colony. She was finding and cleaning out colonies of ants at the rate of 40 to 60 an hour. She was highly adept at this. Uh, ants have a higher percentage of protein than, than regular red meat does, so they're a very valuable food source. I was with Yoda along the Mascoma River in Lyme. Uh, it was a dry fall. There was an abundance of ground nesting hornets or yellow jackets. Yoda made her fall feeding strategy going after ground nesting hornets' nests. She was locating them and cleaning them out at the rate of 12 to 16 an hour. So if, if you're in the uh, woods in the fall or if you work in the woods, uh, you can be really appreciative of, of black bears and their work. Uh, Yoda would smell a colony of bees from about 35 yards off. She'd hone in on the nest and bite into the nest, and about 150 hornets would whack her in the face. She'd shake her head and then go right in and clean out whatever hornets and larvae got in the way. She'd casually walk off with a swarm of hornets over her head, kind of like Pigpen in the Peanuts cartoon. And meantime, her cubs would hit the deck and cover their vitals as they couldn't stand the stings like their mother could. The summer vegetative foods grow in moist, rich soils, uh, usually along rivers and streams and around wetlands. Uh, there's, there's three uh, primary plant groups, jewelweed or touch-me-not that grows in everybody's yard in the spring, several species of wild lettuce, and the most important is jack-in-the-pulpit. And jack-in-the-pulpit is the most important because they eat its root or corn uh, that's more nutritious than either beechnuts or acorns. And in years when there's a nut failure, they'll rely heavily on jack-in-the-pulpit roots uh, to get them through the year. Uh, it's the summer habitat of the black bear that bring bears and people close together. Uh, after all, we settled in the valleys for the same moist, rich soils. Uh, so it's not unusual in New England for somebody to have a nicely mowed lawn leading up to an old orchard with maybe three feet of vegetation. A black bear can be happily out there feeding on jack in the pulpit root, and you'd never know it. You never know it unless you went out there and saw the stompled trails and the occasional divot with the white roots going into it. You'd never know it unless the bear stuck his nose up into the air and smelled black oil sunflower seed. <laughs> black oil sunflower seed has 
three times the calories per unit of any of their natural foods. In the springtime, it's a pretty valuable resource. Um, uh, black bears prioritize their food by the quantity of food, the quality of food, and the amount of risk that it takes to get the food. And that basically says that if there's a good supply of natural foods, uh, there's very little uh, action around people's houses, but if there's no natural food, uh, the bears are more likely to take the risk uh, to come and get your bird feeder. Um, the average black bear needs to put on 30% of its body weight and fat just to survive the winter to get through hibernation. A female black bear giving birth to cubs needs to put on 50% of her body weight and fat uh, to get through the winter to give birth to, to cubs and to nurse them through the early spring. So if you want to understand why bears act the way they do around food, just think about how we act around money. After all, we store our money, we put it in the bank uh, to pay for our retirement or to put our kids through school or to buy a fancy toy. You wouldn't go home tonight and scatter $20 bills all over your yard and have the expectation that nobody would pick any of them up. And that's the same expectation we have when we have food attractants in our yard and we expect that bears won't come take advantage of it. The natural foods that the bears use to put on the fat to reproduce and get through the winter uh, in most of New England are red oak acorns or beech. Uh, in, in, uh, the red oaks are mostly in the southern parts of the states and uh, uh, beech in the northern parts. <clears throat> bears use a number of different types of dens in this picture, I'm crawling out of an excavated den that Yoda used both as a maternal den and a den with her yearlings. Uh, it was under an old root mass of a tree that had blown over many years before. When I crawled into the den and looked up, uh, the ceiling of the den was a matrix of live roots that prevented the soils from collapsing down around her and her cubs uh, during the winter. This is pretty typical for an excavated den, and they're almost always under a tree stump or, or, or or something that prevents the soils from collapsing. This bear had a different strategy. This is what we call an open ground nest. Uh, that's the kind of habitat she was in. The bears like, uh, they're not in their dens to stay warm. They're in there because they're at the most at risk uh, during the winter. They like a lot of structure around them uh, so they can hear somebody approaching easily. Uh, this bear had, a, uh, had an open ground nest. It was about three feet in diameter, maybe 12 inches deep, and nicely rounded on the bottom like a robin's nest. And there she uh, was with her three cubs uh, sticking out of her fur. This is a bear that we uh, took out of our study. Uh, I have a cooperative study with New Hampshire Fish and Game. Maine has a similar study, except they have about 100 bears. We have about 10 bears that we keep collars on. Uh, this bear almost always had an open ground nest and she had a habit of running, uh, which made it difficult. It risked uh, the cubs' lives, so I, I felt it was uh, wiser to get her out of the study so we didn't uh, risk losing cubs. So we just sedated her, removed the collar, and this is how she was in the den when we got there and how her cubs were. They also use rock dens. And these dens are just the piles of rocks below the ledges uh, throughout New England. Uh, these dens make our winter den work difficult because a bear can get into a hole that's not much bigger than its head. Uh, their shoulders are very supple. Uh, their back is uh, very flexible. They can wiggle down into the rocks in places we can't think about getting. It's not unusual to see a bear in one of these dens, maybe even sedated, but getting it out to change a collar can be very difficult. We thought about uh, creating the perfect uh, UNH student who was skinny, strong, and flexible. We could lo lower down by his bootstraps to pull these bears out. But so far, that, that uh, project hasn't worked very well. Here's a yearling bear with its mother in a rock den. And the last type of den I'll talk about are tree dens. Uh, these are in overgrown trees. Uh, when they get to be about three feet in diameter, the center of the tree can decay and rot out, leaving a huge cavity. Uh, there may only be two or three inches of live wood. Uh, this particular den was outside of a new residential area in Lyme, my, hotel, my hometown. 
And uh, I got a call from a woman uh, early in April, and she said she had a bear in her tree. And I got there, and sure enough, she had a bear in her tree. And I informed her that the bear had been in her tree all winter long. <laughs> With the complex social behavior that I talk about, one would expect complex communication, and the bears have it. In this picture, Squirty is opening and closing your mouth like that big male was doing in the video. Uh, she's expelling moist air from her lungs. She's picking up scent from the airwaves and drawing it back to her olfactory system. One of the things I discovered about the bear was uh, their vomoronasal system, which is typical in, in most mammals and some reptiles. Uh, it typically uh, picks up large molecules of scent with saliva. Uh, and brings it back to the papilla of the vomeronasal organ. But the bears also have an accessory organ that allows them to identify aromatic compounds. And I discovered this because the first set of cubs that I raised, all the green vegetation that they came across, they held in their mouth. They just hold a leaf in their mouth for a few seconds, something I called mouthing, something I'd never seen before. <clears throat> I had a couple of Brittany Spaniels at the time, so I stuck leaves in their mouths, and they weren't very impressed. Uh, I put leaves in my own mouth and no bells and whistles went off. So as I started learning all the different types of plants uh, that the bears encountered and documented what happened to them. By the end of the summer, the cubs had identified 125 different food items and rejected many, many more. I determined that a bear could tell if a plant was edible simply by holding it in its mouth for a few seconds. And this lends credence to the fact that the Native Americans observed black bears to find out which plants could be used for foods and pharmaceuticals. So if you think about it, a, a, a drug like aspirin, which comes from willow, may ha have had its origins with a Native American observing a black bear uh, eating a willow branch. Uh, the next thing I did was I did a, 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 a dissected a bear skull to find out what this organ looked like. And it, it's, a, it's a large fleshy organ that lays in the vomer, and the vomer is a V-shaped bone that lays under the na nasal septum. Uh, there was a sensory nerve coming down from this organ to the roof of the mouth, which explained the mouthing behavior. But there was also a bundle of sensory nerves that went up the vomer, under the brain, and spread out over the roof of the throat. So all the long range, uh, both, all the long-range communication in black bears is done with scent. And that's what Squirty was doing by opening and closing your mouth. So all the scent comes in through the nose and mouth, passes over these sensory nerves, and they're able to get a read on it. I went, I've gone to museums, and I've, I've found this structure in no other mammals. Uh, and all the other mammals have long-range vocalizations, which the bears lack. Bears have emotional expression, uh, which includes facial expressions, body language, and the intensity of vocalizations. These are generally honest, uh, so you, uh, social animals need to know, uh, have a way to honestly read the mood of those around them. We wouldn't be able to meet in this room if we weren't comfortable with the emotional state of everybody else in this room, and that's written all over our faces. Right now, everybody in this room has uh, a neutral look on their face, something I call subway face. <laughs> you, you, you can experience that anywhere in the world. You're right on a subway. But if somebody were up to something in this room, we, we'd all know uh, who was up to something, and we'd all be uncomfortable. And so it's a very important uh, way of communicating. Um, and, and so in this picture, uh, Squirty has a aggravated look on her face. She has eye expression, eyebrow expression, a general facial expression, and ear expression. When a, when a bear is aggravated, it, it pins its ears, just like a horse or a deer. And uh, in this, she's just put a, one of her cubs up a tree at weaning time. And in this picture, Squirty has a happy face. Now, I've, been, I've heard a lot of bear stories from a lot of people, and I often ask them what the bear looked like. And the answer I always get, it was black. <laughs> <clears throat> now bears differ from most non-human animals because most scientists believe that non-human animals communicate only with emotion. That is, they cry out and others hear them. But bears also have uh, 
communicate with intention or the expression of intention. And if you think about our language, our language is an emotional utterance uh, with mechanical manipulation of our lips, teeth, tongue, and larynx. So we can intentionally lie with our words, but we rely on emotional communication to determine if somebody's telling us the truth or not. Now bears, the, the expression of intention in bears are mechanically generated sounds and actions. So now they can chomp their teeth, they can huff, they can swat, they can false charge, they can make a guttural sound, the, the bears were in that early video, that ho oh, oh, oh. And the meaning of these sounds and actions is based on the context of the situation at the time. So even though they're limited uh, with the number of means of, of communicating, they greatly broaden it with context. So if, if you run across a bear, uh, you're hiking on a hiking trail, and you run across a mother bear with cubs, you know, you're out having a good time, she's out having a good time. She sees you as the aggressor. She might false charge you. And that means she rushes at you, she pounds the ground, expels a big glass, blast of air. Your bodily fluids might loosen a little bit. <laughs> but all she's trying to do is delay confrontation long enough for communication to take place. Bears can read our emo emotional communication. They can read our body language, or our facial expressions, and, and the intonations on our voice. 85% uh, of how we communicate with each other is with emotional communication every day. But most of this is done subconsciously be, uh, because language is so powerful. Language is only 15% of our communication. So, we, when we meet a bear, the bear reads us just fine. We think the bear is from Mars. And that's why I spend as much time as I do uh, writing in my books and, and talking about communication in black bears. It's something that's easy to read. It has the same mix of intention and emotion as, as our language. And, and the expressions are the same as ours. You know, it's very easy to see what's going on in a bear's mind. Um, I'm not, uh, now, if you're walking, it, and, I, and I'm talking about context, uh, if you're working at a restaurant and you car carry a pail of food scraps out to the dumpster and a bear falls charges you, he simply wants you to drop the pail of food scraps before you put it in the dumpster. <laughs> I was with Squirty one afternoon on Lambert Ridge and Lime. It was a beautiful sunny day and this thunderhead came rumbling up the valley. Squirty false charged the thunderhead. <laughs> And believe it or not, the thunderhead turned and left and the sun came back out. <laughs> now I'm going to show you a video of squirty false charging. It's a fairly aggressive false charge and I'm going to follow it with a more moderate one uh, to show you the difference in intensity. But this, this first false charge, the context is that the last film that was done, documentary that was done about my work by National Geographic, uh, A Man Among Bears, uh, the film crew showed up and expected to film Squirty for eight hours. Uh, Squirty showed up and thought 40 minutes was more appropriate. <laughs> and this is Squirty telling the film crew to get out. She's had enough of them. Now, I filmed that from 10 feet away with a handheld video camera. You didn't see things jump very much. I've been false charged thousands of times, and I pay attention to the context each time, and, and if I'm working with Squirty, I, I remember one time a, a Frosty Hammond from Vermont was wa watching some of my video, and I, I happened to say, all right, Squirty, I'm gonna leave, and he says, what'd you see? And I, I, what I saw was Squirty's eyes started to twitch a little bit. And when bear's eyes twitch, they're making up their mind about something. The next thing that would have happened would have been a false charge. And I realize that when I'm working with Squirty or working with any of the bears that I work with, I'm taking their time. I'm costing them money. Uh, so that there's only a, a certain amount of time they'll tolerate me. So I listen very carefully to these signals. And there's also bears that just like to false charge. I get some that false charge me all, all the time. They false charge me when they want something from me. So uh, there, there's lots of different contexts. And in this, this time, Squirty was perfectly relaxed. Uh, you could see her mind working. You could see her face contort and go into a long face, and then she delivered the false charge. 
Um, and then she went back, she chomped a few times, uh, which is a, a nervous chomp, and then she went back into a relaxed state. And uh, that, that's when you just get up and go, because that's what the message was. In this next film, uh, this is Squirty's uh, granddaughter, Wanda, and Wanda's got some young cubs, uh, and, and Wanda just likes to false charge. She does it all the time. And uh, she false charges me and then walks right up to me. And you'll, and you'll see that it's much less uh, aggressive than Squirty's false charge. Now I talk about intentional communication, and I, th I think that intention, my belief is that intentional communication came from the fact that bears communicate and cooperate with strangers on a regular basis. And, and I think that's where our language also came from. Because if you think about it, uh, you can communicate with family members and you can do that with grunts and groans. Everybody knows what you're up to. You don't have to be very specific around your house. But when you go out in the real world, you've got to get it right, or there are ramifications. And in the bear's world, they have to be able to deceive or bluff, and they have to have uh, some form of intentional communication. Now, proving that in my thesis, I use this film, because in this film, uh, uh, Wanda is, is teaching her cubs the meaning of her vocalization. Female bears manage their cubs with two vocalizations, a gulp, which is a oh, oh and, a, and a, what I call a chirp, which is an uh, uh. And she's using both of these, and they, they, they do it in syntax with body language. So she'll, if there's danger around, she'll gulp and she'll walk away uh, trying to get her cubs to follow her. Uh, she'll use it uh, to get the cubs to go up a tree. If she wants them to come down out of the tree, she'll sit at the bottom of the tree looking up and gulp, and they'll come down out of the tree. She'll lead them away and gulp, and they'll follow her. So it's, it's the use of two different signals, uh, which is syntax. And in this film, the cubs are very young. Uh, they haven't learned uh, the meaning of these vocalizations. Uh, I raised cubs myself. Uh, I understood this, and I couldn't ever teach them uh, the meaning of gulps. So I tried all the time. Uh, but I didn't have 24-7 with them, and I didn't know what a mother bear knows. So this is Wanda. Uh, she senses there's another bear around, she senses danger, and you'll hear her gulps and chirps. She's getting nervous, and the cubs are oblivious of it. She's pulling on them, uh, encouraging them to go. She walks away while gulping, trying to get him to follow her. Cubs still oblivious of, of the fact there's any danger around. She's trying to get him to climb the tree. A little bit of, of physical encouragement. Still not much response. One of them still uh, not paying any attention. Demonstrating for him. Finally, she gets him up on the tree. Still not persuaded. And then finally they go and she enforces him. <clears throat> this indicates that she has some form of theory of mind. She knows her cubs lack the ability to understand what she's trying to teach them. And uh, she, she works on it until she gets it. By the time they're yearlings, those cub, cubs will respond with every single sound she makes and, and very automatically to her commands. The next thing that I've done over the past 20 years, uh, there's a number of psychological conditions that go along with the reciprocal altruism, and, and one of them is that any animal that's an altruist must have a judicial system, otherwise the, the cheaters take hold. Uh, as humans, we have a very advanced uh, judicial system. We have DNA and fingerprinting. 
Uh, but even that has its, its weak parts. Uh, we have to have the fingerprint or the DNA off the perpetrator. We have to find it at the crime scene, and then we've got to find the perpetrator. Very rarely do all those things come together. But the bear's judicial system is far superior to our own uh, because if the bear smells another bear uh, that's broken its rules and Squirty manages her, her social hierarchy, with rules, uh, all the female bears of her, her relatives who stay inside of her greater home range must obey her rules. And if they don't, she punishes them. Uh, bears have a transparency about wherever they travel. Wherever they travel, anywhere their fur or feet touch the ground, they deposit a little bit of scent that another bear can follow for 48 hours or more. So if one bear breaks another bear's rules, they can track them down and exact punishment at any time. They also follow each other to find food uh, because they uh, food, uh, share food at concentrated food sources. Uh, they develop uh, trails. They follow each other to find uh, locations of food. If you have a bird feeder, a bear come to your bird feeder in your yard and you fail to take it in and leave it out for a while, uh, other bears will follow that bear to the food source and within a week or so you'll have eight or ten different bears showing up to your bird feeder. Bears are also deliberate markers. Uh, you might argue that this bear was crawling underneath the sapling and depositing, now she's depositing sebaceous oil, which carries large molecules of scent that are long lasting but have very little smell. Uh, you might argue that she's not doing that on purpose. She just happens to be crawling under the sapling. But in the lower picture, it's the same sapling but a different bear. And this bear has it over her back and she's pulling it like that making sure she deposits all the spacious oil she can on there uh, that's possible. Now the meaning of these marks is also based on context. You can go into the woods and find bear sign and all you can do is speculate as to what it means. If you see a bear marking you have a little more sense, but the bears know what it means. This is Squirty's daughter SQ2 following her mate with that transparent set during the breeding season. She wants to reconnect with him. Uh, she's marking over his trail. And she's hoping that he'll cross the trail and smell her marks and follow up on her and meet up with her again. You know, I know it's a male bear because she's stretching uh, to smell his scent. Uh, female bears only stand five feet high and male six foot eight. So you can see her detecting scent. She's using uh, her breath to lift scent and her tongue. She's following that transparent scent. She'll do a funny stiff-legged walk, disrupting the soil under her feet, leaving a symbolic message, and dropping little drops of urine, identifying herself. And then finally, she'll walk over a sapling, picking up scent from her underbelly. The sapling will flip up behind her, acting like an olfactory antenna. So these bears are very busy communicating with each other all day long. The most important reason that bears mark is to get together during the mating season. A female bear may know who she wants to mate with, but if he hasn't found her first, she has to find him. And when she does, she'll travel uh, the perimeters of her home range. Uh, the male bears will mark on these red pine trees or telephone poles or, your, or, or novel objects like your favorite cabin in the woods where they bite the corners off. They'll back up to the tree, they'll flex their knees, they'll hold their paws out, and they'll rub that sebaceous oil into the porous bark of a tree. Uh, the, then they'll rotate their head and bite uh, whatever it is they're marking on. You'll see the fresh bite up there. That releases aromatic compounds from the sap, which waffle, waffle off and attract other bears to their marks. The same reason they bite buildings, again, to release the aromatic compounds uh, of, the, of the boards on the building. So the female bear will come along. She'll locate the male she wants to mate with. She'll mark on the tree and wait nearby. He'll come back. They'll get together and they'll get out of Dodge. Uh, there'll be an entourage of young subadults that follow breeding males around. Uh, so everywhere the female goes, uh, wherever she stops to feed, he'll set up a two acre territory around her, back rubbing on multiple trees, doing that stiff legged walk, walk, leaving deep sunken footprints, warning other bears that she's been taken. And meanwhile, the, her condition of estrus is on the airwaves, uh, attracting other bears. 
Here's a 350-pound male traveling with a female during the breeding season, uh, back rubbing on a tree. 